call to order the <clears throat> Monday, November 19th meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board being recorded by ACMI. First on our agenda this evening is an appointment of a member to the Housing Plan Advisory Committee. Um, as uh, you may remember, in August you appointed seven members to the Advisory Committee. Um, there was no one representing the Housing Authority at that time, and I've since spoken with John Griffin, who's the Executive Director, and he has agreed to serve on that committee. So um, I'm hoping that you will uh, approve his membership. Just to update you, they're having their first meeting on October 22nd, which is this Thursday. We've hired MAPC to do the plan. Um, we have a $15,000 grant from the state to pay for a consultant to do a housing plan. So we need a motion to appoint Mr. Mm -hmm. Griffin. Um, I'll move that we appoint uh, John Griffith. Uh, Griffin. The, Griffin, excuse me, Griffin. to the Housing Plan Advisory Committee. My second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. All right, next up is a proposed zoning amendment by a town resident. Um, I think they're here this evening. I'd ask them to come up and present that to us, please. You want us at the table? Yes, yes. please. Sure. Introduce, introduce each of your Absolutely. cells mm -hmm. uh, with address, please. Do you guys, do you have anything? And Laura Notman, who is an architect, an industrial architect working with us, is, has some handouts for you that she's going to pass out now. Um, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, absolutely. So, for the record, my name is Dorothy Held. I live on 184 Jason Street in Arlington. My business partner is Christelle Salami, who lives in Beverly, Massachusetts. Uh, and then we also have Laura Notman, who is an industrial architect, who also lives on Longfellow Road, I believe, in Arlington, Massachusetts. Feel free to have a seat. Okay. You're more comfortable, please. Yeah. All right, so we are here to talk about repurposing a particular property for dog daycare and boarding. Um, in this case, we are talking about 10 study side, but we want to emphasize that, you know, that maybe this is an option for other properties in, in the town. We just haven't done the analysis. So as way of background, Christelle and I have known each other for 10 years. Um, we've been talking about this seriously for five, and now we're doing it. And um, Laura, who I've met when I moved to Arlington, is an industrial architect who is helping us as we assess properties in Arlington and, and elsewhere, and also undertaking the feasibility study. And we've spent quite a bit of time on this particular property at 10 Sunnyside. So what I'm going to do tonight, uh, you have a uh, rough framework of what we wanted to talk about. And the first two bullet points are really focusing on the business of dog daycare and why we see a need, and particularly for Arlington. The third point is talking about the zoning uh, constraints in Arlington, which is why we're here today, of course. And then the last uh, point is really to talk about our vision and also why we believe really it's going to serve the community at large. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll begin with the introduction of why this business, why for me, and, and how Christelle and I came together, because I don't think it's that um, uncommon, my story. I am a single woman with a dog. I am a busy working person. I have long hours, and there was a time when I was traveling quite a bit, and I wanted a dog. I wanted companionship. And while there's many backstories about the certain ways that I tried to fulfill that need, ultimately I decided I needed a a dog care service that was 24-7, which is to say 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, for him, you know, dogs are pack animals, so they like to be with a pack. They're very social animals. Uh, so I wanted a cage-free environment. I also wanted it to be well supervised, okay? Um, I wanted a, a routine that was familiar to him, so whether he was there during the day or whether he was there at night, you know, he was going to be a, a happy dog and not suffer from separation anxiety or uncertainty or whatever it may be. So, yes, he's my kid, undeniable, I don't apologize for that. So, um, when I was looking for this, there was really nothing in, in any, anywhere convenient, um, and I found Pet Companions, which is where... Uh, Christelle was managing up until recently, and I met Christelle and I met Pet Companions out in Reading, and, and it is exactly this philosophy that I uh, just expressed. Uh, for me, again, I wanted a seamless um, experience for the dog, a routine, a true home away from home. Something that was institutional and not um, what I will call 
babysitting, which isn't, there's no problems with babysitting, it's just I needed for my lifestyle something more. Okay, so how do we measure whether my experience is a growing demand in the community, okay? <coughs> well, we can start with the Arlington dog licenses, and in 2012, it was roughly 1,800, and um, this is on your website, by the way, um, and it's grown to an estimated 2,200. Um, now, Arlington A-Dog, with a conversation with the president there, we learned that that's estimated to be 30% of the households. In other words, there's 70% who are not licensing their dogs. So that comes up with an estimated 7,300 uh, dogs in the community. That being said, I don't put a lot of money on the data and... You know, we just don't know if, if, if the dog per household has grown, or we just don't know much about that data. So I don't, I'm not going to use it as an argument for demand. Um, I think instead, oh, and let me just say that that data conundrum, if you will, exists on a state and a national level. If you do a survey of dogs per household national, you're going to come up with all sorts of mixed analysis and, you know, speaking to the integrity of those surveys. That said, so let's let's maybe flip it around and say, Acknowledging that the household, as we know today, is very different from what it was 20 years ago. So what people care and want may be different now than it was 20 years ago, whether the number of dogs have increased or not. Uh, so how do you know? let's look at supply. Has supply grown? Is there demand? And therefore, would supply follow? Um, to that point, I'm going to talk about two things locally. Okay. When we did, we started looking at this five years ago, we did a competitive analysis. Christelle has recently picked up that competitive analysis. In fact, there are many more smaller daycares that have um, you know, put their shingles on the door recently. And I'm going to characterize those strictly as this daycare, and also with limited space, and also um, you know, with limited time. So you're t talking about an 8 a.m. drop-off and a 6 or 6.30 p.m. pickup, which again, for someone in my situation, is not going to fit because we're looking for an expanded um, pickup and drops off somewhere from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. to allow for flexibility of, you know, uh, challenging home schedules. All right, so there are more dog sitters, daycare providers out there than there were, but on a limited basis. Another data point that I think is interesting, um, which doesn't speak to this community, but shows you maybe the demand for this type of service or for dog care service, is that um, both dogvacay.com and rover.com are two web-based platforms that have seeked um, funding and have had two rounds of venture funding. In 2012 and 2013, they both um, hit $15 million in uh, venture funding, and then uh, most recently, in the past 12 months, they both went for a second round and got $25 million. Now, we are not proposing <laughs> a web-based platform for dog sitters. Again, we're looking to do something that's more institutional in nature and has a standard of quality and it has accountability because, after all, this is not, um, this is not a regulated service. And, and in fact, while I'm sure that there are a lot of good dog sitters and a lot of good babysitters, there's also an opportunity, because it's unregulated, that people can put their, their shingle on the door and promise a lot of pretty pictures and I'm great with dogs and then put the dog in the bathroom for, for the weekend and, you know, unless the dog has died, there's, you know, what's the accountability? How do we know what that dog's experience was? Okay, so... Again, what we're looking to do at All Dig Dogs is a more institutional, um, uh, a more institutional experience, quality of experience that has space, that has supervision, that has high staff to dog ratios. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, the zoning issues that we have, and this is specifically if you look on the regulation of use um, zoning at 6.11. And if you read it through, it, and, and, and we have many times, and we did with um, staff of uh, Arlington as well, at the end of the day, it limits two things that are critical to our business plan. And that is one, outdoor space, and that's also boarding. So let's talk about maybe um, the outdoor space first. And I'll leave it to you guys to, to address the concerns of the community. I'll just say from a business person's, dog care business person's perspective, there's some un, you know, unintended consequences that come out of that. And basically, where, do you, where, where, are, where are dog care, daycare providers curbing their dogs? And the reality is that they're doing one of two things. They're either curbing them inside, where, whereas um, the dogs take those behaviors home, and it also 
you know, raises some health issues for both dogs and other dogs and staff alike. Or they're taking their dogs out into public throughways, sidewalks and streets, if you will. Um, we've done an analysis of who's, you know, doing that and what we're finding interestingly enough is that not only are a lot of the daycares taking their dogs outside onto the public throughways, but they're charging you an extra 10 or 15 bucks to do that. Um, which is fine. I mean, they're trying to make ends meet and, and you know, I shouldn't put it, but the point I'm trying to say is that, that we're looking to do something that, um, uh, you know, that really addresses the health and, um, you know, the health needs of the dogs and the staff that work there. Um, I guess the other thing that I would say about um, outdoors space is that, um, you know, what we're looking to do is enclose space for dogs, both indoor and outdoor. So it's going to be enclosed and you're not going to have, you know, um, you're going to have very limited con contact with the um, surrounding community. We're also looking to have a location that has parking so that we <coughs> adhere to a very, you know, uh, restrict, you know, strict onboarding process whereby dogs are delivered to the facility on leash from the parking lot. Okay, so again, we're looking to really um, control that environment where dogs are in contact with a broader community. And then there's the issue of overnight boarding. Uh, currently nothing exists, so I am sort of backtracking talking about needs here. So uh, this is a, a, a problem for a lot of Arlington um, and you know, surrounding community uh, folks. They only have essentially Crate Escape and, and PetSmart, and you can ask uh, Christelle during Q&A, but during peak periods, there's just no boarding around. It's very limited, and we're talking about predominantly July and August and during the holidays as well. Um, so what about boarding? Well, the way that we see it again as, a, as business people is that our, we open our doors at 6.30, we close them at 8.30. Um, that's when all the traffic and the, you know, the activity occurs are between those hours. When we have our boarding dogs, at 8.30 the, do the doors shut down and everyone goes in for the night. Um, now, I can't promise that there won't be noise, particularly during peak seasons, because as Christelle can tell you, you know, there are times when you have to let dogs out at night to go to the bathroom, because if one goes, they all go. Um, but by and large, it's, it's you know, we don't, we don't see it as, as, a big, as a big issue. And we also would note um, that, that there are ordinances in place that if it were to be an issue, the noise factor um, and the overnight, that the surrounding community has recourse. Okay, so I'm going to make sure I've covered all my points here. Um, I, oh yeah, no, I want to talk about real estate for a minute. So you're saying, well, if there's so much of a need, why aren't there more people doing what you're suggesting that you want to do now? And the reality is that the cost of real estate, as well as the zoning, make it prohibitive. So if you are doing daycare, you're not going to be able to afford um, a, a place with space. And um, you know, and also, you know, and also, by the way, that's why you'll see some pretty high dog daycare prices too. The beauty of the boarding and the daycare, um, you know, uh, business plan, if you will, is which, by the way, is what we want to do because we believe in the home away from home. But regardless, of that from an economic standpoint, you're now taking that fixed cost and you're leveraging it 24/7. And the the two takeaways from that are one is that you. You, know, you now have margin, and you can manage your pricing, and you can also pay your staff. And um, we've used, we've, we've had the benefit of the numbers from the, the daycare that um, Christelle was managing, and <coughs> we're very comfortable that not only can we maintain a high staff-to-dog ratio, we can pay them well, and, you know, we can deliver it um, and, and, and make this business work while paying for the real estate and making the conversions that need to, to take place. So uh, is 10 minutes gone up? No, we've still got. So let's talk about um, 10 Sunnyside as we see it, or, or any place as we see it, um, the business of it. You know, we aspire to a safe, healthy, <coughs> and controlled environment. I want to reiterate that the surrounding community will have limited contact with the dogs. The indoor and outdoor spaces will be enclosed. Um, and I'll note here, too, that the outdoor space is also an important exit in the event that there's some sort of um, natural or disaster or otherwise, uh, fire or earthquake, if you will, for the dogs to go. So we like that. Um, we like that. 
the on-site parking for leash dogs, drop-offs, and pickup. Health. The outdoor play is um, a good place for them to use the bathroom. And I also emphasize, and, and Laura can speak in more detail about that, is that we're doing a lot of analysis on the turf systems and the flooring systems to manage the waste. Because honestly, we don't want staff spending a lot of time picking up waste. We feel like if we can keep staff happy, we keep dogs happy, and if we keep dogs happy, we keep clients happy. So putting in the investment to make an efficient um, waste management system will you know, do well for our business <laughs> at large. Uh, noise control, I'll just reiterate some of the things that, that we've said and maybe add a few points. Um, here Christelle can give you the background, but dogs are social animals, and often when they're in the pack, they're engaged, and an engaged dog is a quieter dog. A high staff to dog ratio, which means that dogs are being supervised, and Chriselle can talk about some of the methods that they use at PCI to manage the pack, which you know keeps them quiet. And then I'll also say, as um, business people, we will be doing temperament testing. This won't be a, a daycare or, or boarding facility for all dogs, and noisy dogs simply won't be invited back. I mean, you know, that's unfortunate, but that's just the way we have to manage the business. And then, as I as I had stated earlier, there is a noise ordinance in place. So then, in the event that there's you know some disruption that's bothering the neighbors, they have recourse. We also think that this business would do well to serve the community. Um, our business plan calls for, on average, 14 people uh, working there during the week. We see it as a local option, something that we're eager to brand as local and, you know, um, what do you say, grounds up, you know, the real deal, not a big box, uh, not a pet smart. Um, you know, you'll know the people and, and working there and, and they'll be part of the community. We're excited about this particular location, and, and I would say that this is, in general, who we are anyway. It's a historic warehouse, and you know, sort of bringing back um, that character, you know, revitalizing it, bringing to life, in, you know, for our purposes, is, is pretty exciting. And then we've also um, are looking into landscaping uh, where we can to not only you know make the community pretty, but also manage things like noise and um, you know other other factors. So. With that, that is our proposal for repurposing 10 Sunnyside, and we really welcome your questions. And Christelle, again, my business partner, and Laura, our architect, are you know available to dig in on on our on our uh, handouts as well as um, thoughts and concerns. Bruce, Laura. I just I wonder if you would mind if the staff, if Ted just presented his. Put it in the context of what we're doing here as part of yes, the work plan. Oh, good evening. Do you want to sit up here? That's no, okay. Uh, I'm a former member of the board, so I've sat up there enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, we met with um, uh, Ms. Held and, and uh, Christelle, um, and we discussed their concerns and their plans, and uh, they asked us, um, you know, they brought to our attention the fact that zoning right now. Uh, really doesn't allow for all day, 24 hour boarding care of dogs. Um, the closest thing is a veterinary care facility where boarding is accessory and accessory use to the medical uh, functions uh, of the facility. So that's clearly not what they propose to do. Uh, so they were thinking that uh, zoning would have to be changed to accommodate the use that they propose. Um, and as I uh, indicate in the memo that was part of your packet, um, we believe that instead of uh, inserting or instead of adding a new use into zoning, it might be uh, easier and, and uh, just better to amend the language under 6.11 to read uh, veterinary and animal care, including temporary day and nighttime lodging, providing all shelter facilities are within an enclosed building. Um, and uh, instead of adding a new use or, or something along those lines. Um, so, uh, and this would be just in business and industrial areas right. by special permit? By special permit. So you would still get to review every one? Well, well mm -hmm. actually the CBA would be reviewing many of them. If they were on Mass Ave, you know, in, in right. your areas, you would be yeah. reviewing them. Mm -hmm. but, we didn't think that it should be by right. Just no, definitely special permit controls. Yeah. Personal questions. I guess 
actually, my first question is probably to Ted, just to follow up on your uh, zoning analysis. Um, is this would this only be in um, B four, or is this in a number of different districts? Uh, I believe it is. Let me check. It is. Uh, well, they propose the location. They propose it as a B four district. Um, changing it to six eleven would be in B two through B five, but with special permit control. Obviously, you know the it, locational characteristics for the, in, in all of those districts. Yes. Yeah. And, and industrial. And yes, and industrial too. Uh, is that is that better than or equal to that in industrial? Uh, no, actually, it's not. Okay. It's not allowed in industrial, so that would have to change. Okay, so that would go from. No, to right. SP. Yes, SP. Yeah. You know, I'll just throw this out there. There's another property that I just saw came up for lease that's next to Stop and Shop. It's on Acton, and if you showed me the map, I could tell you what it is. It's right next to um, Stop and Shop um, Prentice? No. I don't know. But anyway, the point is, it, it's perfect in some regards, except for it's right next to residential. And um, not to. to you know, one of the beauties is, is that we are looking for something that has a little more uh, space so that we can offer the outdoor. And in this case, uh, we've measured it, and you're talking 238 um, on one direction is our closest resident, and 200 feet is, is the other one. So in this case, um, you know, just arguing, I guess, on our behalf for this particular property, we think that it has some unique characteristics that some of the other space want. And I guess that's why you're recommending special permit. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I'm just, just to follow to... up on that. So, how how would industrial zoning would you add that into the allowable district? Right. Okay. Sorry, please. No. Um, I actually I, I I like the concept. I think it's a good idea. I think it's one that uh, there's a need for. Um, I think one of the things just to sort of anticipate to anticipate how this might play out at town meeting because the zoning change requires two thirds vote of, of town meeting. Um, is you're going to get the question of uh, how divergent is this use from what we have now? Um, because whether you're folding it into uh, the existing 6.11 use or creating a new use, it is a little bit of a new use. You know, oh, it's absolutely. A little different. Undeniable. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's. Just a question. On, I, it, this is really more of a comment as opposed to oh, a question. Oh yeah, absolutely. To you. you bring them on because I think that um, you know we're pretty committed. I guess to your point that we're waiting to do you know go through an April one. I mean, quite honestly, if, we, if this wasn't an issue, we would be um, our realtor Shanna Frankham is here. We would be working on putting together an offer for this property. I'll be mm -hmm. frank with you. And time is money, and it's so I'm not going to tell you we're not looking at properties, but it's you know. It, it's kind of a bummer to have to, to work through that. On the other hand, we figure, like, if you guys, if we think we can do this and we have all the questions and we address them, and, you know, <laughs> then we'll just look at the next three months between December and April as a marketing. <laughs> you know, we're just marketing ourselves, making our case and getting people to know us. And so we'll, we'll, we'll turn it into something positive, right? Yeah. But the, the bottom line is, um, you know, I, I would say that's probably a good question for, um, sorry, Ted, to put this on you, but, but it is a, a new it is a new use. Um, I, you know, personally feel like it's a new use that's needed, and it's going to be value add to that particular area of the community. I think it's going to. Mm -hmm. it, don't get me wrong. I think the the current owner has done a lot to make the. Um, you know, he's put a lot of love into that building. Let me be clear. But I think we're going to take it to another level, and um, you know, it's it's you know it's going to be a destination spot. It will. the The front warehouse is such that we'll be able to sponsor. Um, you know, events for like the Arlington ADOG group or training and agility training and stuff. So there's there's a lot with that space that we can do that's adjunct, adjunct to the dog daycare, but also, you know, provides a real service to the community. So more than it's yeah. And then my last question, again, this is really more towards staff, but just, and, and it may be alleviated by the fact that we're talking about a special permit as opposed to has a right, but are there other sites in town that would be within the, the zoning net here that we're throwing down for B2 through B5 and industrial 
where this might be problematic. And I'm not expecting that you have an encyclopedia in your mind of all of these sites, but just is there you know, an area where we're find, bumping up against a residential uh, district where it could be problematic? Perhaps parts of Dudley Street where there are residential interspersed mm -hmm. with yeah. business and industrial um, zoning. But I, I think that's why the, uh, the Sunnyside uh, location question is ideal because there really is very few uh, resi there's no residential about it. It's quite a bit farther down the street. Yes, the side yes, it's really area. quite isolated from residential mm -hmm. contact yeah. and at, by both grade and space. Um, so I think it's an ideal spot in that low in that regard. Uh, other spots that we've looked at are a little bit more problematic. They're closer to residential areas. But there are currently uh, veterinary facilities that are right abutting right. residential areas. And um, I think you know part of your first question was how how much does it diverge from that existing use? And in some ways, you have better control in this type of a facility than in the veter veterinary facilities because dogs going to the vet are often quite anxious. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's I mean I go to the vet pretty often, and um, um, you know you have dogs coming in and out on short time frames. Right. You know. Um, so you have a lot of traffic back and forth, and dogs who are a little bit anxious and nervous, you know, a greater risk of them kind of getting loose mm -hmm. up the street. And there's certainly a lot of vocalization inside of the vet. Um, so, you know, it's probably not that different um, from, a, you know, in terms of right. Could the even impact. Be even impact, but different a, in a better way, right. maybe. But it's a larger too. facility. <clears throat> What's proposed is larger than the existing vet facilities in Arlington. Mm -hmm. But those are often right within the residential neighborhood. So um, having it be a special permit at least allows that consideration to be done. Of, you know, what are, what are the neighborhoods and what would the impacts be? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I, I have something that's a great idea. Probably needed. Um, but along those lines, just thinking of town meeting and so forth, what kinds of, like, what are your comps that, the ones that are in other towns and things, how do they, how do they work and what kinds of issues might those, might come up relative to those? Is it, and it's not, it's not a kennel, right? It's, not, it's different. No, it's cage free. Um, Purcell can answer some of this, but let me ask, um, if you're asking about comps, are you asking about competition? Are you talking about operation? Are you talking about uh, other, uh, other communities' experience no, looking just, for boarding and zoning? I no, just yeah. like other types of facilities like this. Okay, so... Um, As an example. Maybe not yeah. exactly like your business Where's, model, but... I guess Crane Escape would be the Yeah, Crane Escape is, would be the closest. Um, that's on, I just want to get out of our What's it called again? Crate Escape, Crate which is on Blanchard Road, Crate Escape. right across from Fresh Pond Animal Hospital. And then the other comp, of course, is PetSmart. Um, I don't know Crate Escape yeah. uh, facility in great detail. I do um, know that they offer boarding. Um, How big are they? They are large in terms of square footage. I want to say because I went onto the. It just moved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I want to say that that it's it's very large. So in terms of space, I don't think that they have an issue. However, how um, many dogs do they? I don't know. We can try and uh, ask. But keep in mind again, this goes to this whole point that it's unregulated. So there's no one that is. Yeah. You know, I know that we believe in, in this. Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, that the Board of Health in Arlington will have some responsibility of oversight for our facility. Right. But right now, um, there's no, best practices are really, you know, up to you to decide. What we have decided is to look at the ASPCA, the animal, the association of whatever, ASPCA, we all know it, right? <laughs> I'm just having a mind, you know, block. Um, is really saying that uh, 75 square foot per dog and, you know, 15 um, dogs per staff person. And I would challenge you to actually walk in and make, you know, this notion of 75 square foot dogs in New England is, is that's a tall order to meet in terms of cost. So, do you, you want to comment on that? Well, I was just wondering about the, the Brookline. Um, Why don't you talk about that? So, a good there one. is a, a 
facility in, in Coolidge Corner in Brookline. Uh -huh. It's actually on the second floor of a building mm -hmm. in the middle of Coolidge Corner. And they have, I think they board about 35 dogs. <coughs> so 50. 50, 50 yes, altogether. Yeah, 50 is their maximum, and they typically have about 35. And they don't have any outdoor space, so they take the dogs out in Coolidge Corner on leash, um, <laughs> which I think is not an ideal situation, but, you know, they're right in the middle of a dense commercial residential neighborhood. Right. So I think this is a much more ideal setup than that would be. But they seem to be, and Brookline is not the kind of town where people don't seem to care about things. So, um, <laughs> so I think they've managed to, you know, make it work um, in terms of, you know, it's in, a, it's in an old building that they've renovated. Um, the dogs... I guess go up the stairs. I'm not sure if they have an elevator. I think it might be useful just to have that in your in your arsenal in our, or whatever. In mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you're 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 obviously doing something that you want to be a new paradigm or whatever, a new kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. But yes. it has it can be compared to various other types of things and why is it different? You yeah. kind of touched yeah. on so, all that. I think it would help to and, and those those things. that don't know about this kind of thing would want to know. Yeah, and they want to know it's not a kennel, it's not a vet, it's you know it has all this. It's a dog care facility, dog twenty-four care facility, yeah. hours, seven day a week. Um, <coughs> it's come under a lot of demand these days, uh, working people, so forth and so on and so forth. But um, we can only point to things that are similar, and this is how we see this working and how it compares to other types of. Things. I think that would kind of. I think that up. is a point well taken. Well, I think you're going to get the question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah and I think it's a good question too. <coughs> they tend, I, you know, they tend to come at you like, oh, well, it's a kennel. Are we going to allow that in our town? No. Barking. Right. Barking. 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 Barking and barking. 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 <laughs> you talked a lot about oh, that's barking. Cute. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to ask you a little bit about that. So I think comps, or well, I was using that word, but you know, comparable things. Spaces. Would, or no, no more just the model and yeah. how the space is different. Well, I think along. I think I the Coolidge Corner one. I think is you'd also want sort of comparable statutes as to what you're looking to have amended to our zoning bylaw. How Brookline handles it, how Belmont handles it in Arizona. Okay. I think that'd be really helpful as well. Maybe okay. that's something you can do ahead of time. Yes. Yep. You'll definitely want to be prepared to answer that question at town meeting. That's, okay. That's okay. something that if you can present that right off the bat, right? You can tell it yeah, it's, Belmont these just are did how theirs. they're handled yeah. and they're successful. Yep. Or, not successful, and this is why we're doing it in a different way. Yep. Right, and then they'll go to the barking. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can I have a stick art. I live in a place where there's a dog that barks every night, and now you're telling me I've got 50 dogs? That's not going to fly, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you have to, and I think you have placed it in the right context. Um, but about the barking and the, so is it, there's indoor and there's outdoor, which is great. I think I love the idea. And how much, how do you control the noise outside is going to be the question. I can answer that. So I've been working, well, I just recently left to dedicate 100% of my time on this, but um, Pet Companions in Reading, right on Main Street. There's actually a neighbor across the street, which is like less than 200 feet away. Never had a complaint. Um, and uh, what's important to know is that, like a, a regular kennel, like you leave dogs in those runs, and you know, when dogs are not being attended to, they tend to bark a lot because they're anxious, they want attention. So what do they do? They bark because they want somebody to come and hang out with them, right? At a daycare like this, when dogs are playing with each other, they keep each other entertained. Mm -hmm. You have a high ratio of staff versus dogs, so maybe about 15 dogs per staff. We can control the dogs. Mm -hmm. um, we can entertain them, play ball with them. Um, there's a lot of different types of dogs. There are dogs that don't really care about dogs, but like to hang out and follow us around. There are dogs that only want to play ball. So as long as you entertain them and play ball with them, they're happy. Uh, there are dogs that just like to play with dogs. So that's what they do. Now, what we do at Pet Companions, uh, they came up with this, they call it the gentle method of correction. So basically what it is, is every time a dog barks, plays a little too rough, or mounts another dog, we will put them on leash and make them sit for a couple of seconds. Let them go. If they do it again, we do it again. 
And dogs learn by repetition, so as long as staff is consistent by doing that every time one of those behavior happens, the dog actually learns mm -hmm. and doesn't do those behaviors. Or they'll do something, because you know, they're a dog, so of course they're going to do one of those three every so often. But they'll see you coming and they sit already. They know it's coming, because they, you know, they know the routine. So as long as a dog responds to the gentle method, they do really well here, there. We could provide videos, you know, I could video the area with 40 dogs outside, you don't hear one buck. Um, so it's, it's possible to actually keep dogs under control that way as long as you keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. Now if you leave them alone outside with no supervision, nothing to do, no balls, no nothing, that's when they'll start barking because they're like, hey, where are you? You know. Right. So it's, it's possible to keep dogs under control. It's interesting too, their space is predominantly outdoor, so they have 3,000 square foot outdoor and you know, maybe you know, six or 700 indoor, so it's a different, we're looking to, to um, take that sort of concept but also add a lot of more indoor space too. Right. Um, and um, on, the, on the zoning, Ted, when you go to, uh, it says, um, would, would the outside space be allowable? I guess it says that. Because it says, sorry, where, where did I see this? Here? It's probably, a, a, here it is, I guess. So it's veterinary and animal care, that's good. Right. <laughs> and including temporary day and night lodging, providing all shelter facilities are within an enclosed building. Well, the shelter facilities, as I read their plan, is they're going to keep the dogs inside at night when they sleep. But there's nothing that's going to jump out saying, well, you can't have an outside area, I hope. Right, an outside recreation area, as I yeah. read their point. The only thing, in the, I mean, it, because um, we, want, we want black and white here, because sometimes the dogs will have to have to go out to go to the bathroom, and then they'll come back in. Well, you, you want it outside, I mean, I like it. The, yeah, <laughs> so, but, but they won't be play, it won't be uh, play recreation outdoors at night. You see right. what I'm saying? So when yes. the door's shut at 8.30, it's, you know, bedtime folks, and the dogs come inside with the exception that they need to go out to go to the bathroom, which in peak periods, you know, is, is probably going to be necessary. It will be necessary, let's be clear. I just want to but make that sure. can be addressed through conditions on the special permit, too, mm -hmm. right, where we say, okay. Yeah. But in town meeting, I don't want them to say, well, that this, this doesn't, isn't written to allow outside. Uh, yeah, outside but, lot, outside right. temporary care. Whatever. Yeah, well, that's why I say I recommend providing all shelter facilities are in an enclosed building. Mm -hmm. I shelter, by, is it yeah. specific enough? Right. Mm -hmm. I read that as enclosed. You're okay to have these things or in an enclosed building. Okay. But I worry about it should be written so that it's mm -hmm. clearly outside exercise yard sure. is allowed. Yeah. And, I mean, that's the yeah. great thing about the concept. Of course. There won't be any dog parties at, at midnight, but yeah, no. <laughs> but yeah. Is, is the sleeping over called boarding? Is that the word that you would use for yes. the overnight? Mm -hmm. Maybe instead of shelter, it should say boarding, boarding if facilities are indoors. We don't mm -hmm. want to place that all outside. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it sounds good. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's also when you're drafting this, if you want to consider. Uh, specifically mentioning outdoor recreational areas right. and then adding but all boarding facilities being inside mm -hmm. within the outdoor daytime building. recreational areas. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Just to make sure that don't. people get it. Yeah, because otherwise there may be confusion about oh, this I mean the dogs are gonna be out at night. It's yeah. it's part of your model mm -hmm. of how you run it. That's why you come as you did, you come forward with that. Exactly. And then this follows up to support that. So you have right. to say it so that they don't misconstrue it. Yeah, that's that's really a draftsmanship type yeah, of, yeah, of yeah, issue, yeah, and yeah. that can be figured out. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Glad to hear you feel that <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, I agree with what they said. I think it's a great it's, idea. It's uh, the board, the overnight thing for weekends. That's what I find. I we need a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want to go out away on vacation or whatever. Yeah, and would it would, would you do it for longer than you know for a week? Oh or? yeah. Yeah. Well, we have dogs that board for a few months sometimes. Right. Yeah. And what about training? Like I know that that's another 
big thing these days, and they sure. offer it in different ways. Do you, would you well, well, I'll tell plan you about in concept. your business plan? Or do it it, yeah, there will be, because this space in particular allows for <clears throat> some training. And we also, um, and, and Christelle can, uh, can speak to this, but we've also given thought. We want to have one of our floor managers have a training background, because the unfortunate part about, I mean, there's good things, but the bad thing about a cage-free environment is that some dogs aren't suited for that experience, right? So rather than saying no, we want to offer potential clients a solution to that. Um, it doesn't mean that the dog will, will be ready, but let's say your dog is fearful of other dogs. Working with the right trainer, you can overcome that, and then the dog might be better for that experience. You see what I'm saying? So Definitely. we feel like a trainer is going to be an important um, element to it, and you know we've had a couple conversations with local trainers. I want to emphasize there's quite a few around here. But I mean that's you know we're kind of we don't have a job to offer yet, so we can't you know talk about that you know who that will be and what that program will look like. But we're we're putting a lot of thought into it. Gotcha. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you. Man. All right. Thanks. What's the next steps here? Do you mind me asking? Well, I think that. Um, Call Ted. Oh, we continue to work <laughs> with the, 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 the planning department staff. Okay. Um, think about how you would want the, uh, you know, the the, uh, the warrant article to okay. read. Yep. Typically, when it's going into the warrant, it's a little, it, it's purposefully kept open. So, because right. the warrant is just noticed that there's going to be this matter discussed at town meeting, and you don't want to make it so narrow that if your thought process evolves a little bit between the warrant deadline and then town meeting that you have, don't wind up with an article that's out of scope. Right. So you tend to keep it on the broad side. So Understood. You make sure, right? um, and then uh, as you get closer to town meeting, you'll want you know the, more or less the exact text that you want to be settled on okay. and you know presentation. Uh, usually these articles, zoning articles, are presented by a member of the board, but it could call okay. up one of you if you wanted to speak. Okay. And you're an Arlington resident, yes. correct? So you could speak at town meeting um, and, and add what you want to the presentation. Remember, though, you're dealing with, I think it's seven minutes. Yeah, so no, you've got to um, be succinct. I don't know if this is right, I, and I don't know how I came up with the schedule, but a warrant would go in around December, and I would start um, with Christelle and Laura meeting the 250 people, you know, from January to April. Every Friday night, there's going to be a party at my house talking about <laughs> doggy daycare. Oh, okay. So you're all welcome. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like we, you said, it's um, marketing, too, right? To I mean, it's uh, an sure. opportunity yeah. to tell people what we're about. There is one, one more dead, one more yeah. milestone, which is the hearing. There will be a hearing before the Redevelopment Board of all the zoning articles. It's usually late February, early March, and we'll make sure you know about it and you can come and present your case. Okay. It's a public hearing. Okay. Hearing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so the warrant is due, though, by December? Uh, it's, it closes the end January. of January, so it's December, January. Okay. But you're good to start thinking about it in December, you know, and yeah. it's always good to have an okay. artificial yeah. deadline in your yeah. mind. Yeah. And Ted will work with you on that. Yeah. Okay, that's fabulous. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't. Thanks. All right. No, thank you, thank you guys. It was a pleasure. Laura, I had the uh, pleasure of meeting Dart, by the way, in the morning. Oh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> dark. I met Dart, yeah. Hey, all three of you do it, Dart. Thank you for Hopefully, when he was being a good boy. <laughs> Not that we have fun. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> Probably to be sure. Okay. All right. Hi. So moving on to design standards adoption. Yes. Yes. Um, this is something we worked on last spring primarily, and it got finalized in June. And we realized that we never brought it back to you to adopt it officially. Um, as of now, it is not a part of the zoning officially. It is just um, really guidelines that uh, the, the building inspector has as well and um, will apply in discussion with proponents. Uh, I think if, if we... Uh, we can 
even talk about whether or not we think it should be part of the zoning. Um, I've always thought maybe it would be nice to test it out a little bit before we make it part of the zoning, so it will depend on if any projects come in in the near future. But um, we were hoping that you would um, adopt it tonight if you're comfortable doing that. If you have more questions, go right ahead. start. Uh, I'm very impressed, actually. I think the presentation looks great um, and, you know, has enough color in it to make it kind of, uh, you know, user-friendly. Um, and I like the matrix idea where it's, you know, easy to sort of find, you know, what column I'm in and then what the, uh, what the other, uh, the guidelines are. Um, and, uh, Laura, you're point is a good one. Maybe it does make sense to have this as just a guideline that's not officially part of the zoning, but, you know, if you are applying for something, particularly if it's going to get up to one of the, the boards, either the uh, ZBA or the ARB, um, and you're hitting a lot of these items on it, you know, it looks like you're really, you, you've got a project that's going to, you know, sit well with the respective board. Um, and then if it turns out that this is, we want to sort of codify it and put it into the bylaw, <coughs> then great. But, uh, I, I, I like it. I think it's a great start. Um, so th I like it too. This is good. Um, is it editable now or is this yes. done? Oh, okay. yes. Yes. Um, on Minuteman Bikeway, down in the second s highlighted section, mm -hmm. taller buildings should be stepped back to diminish shadows, address adjacent. You might say, I mean, this is just, just a thought. I'm trying to think out loud a little bit, but define maximum allowable shadow encroachment, I wrote down. What you want to do is protect the light and sun on the road, I mean on the minute pad bikeway. Mm -hmm. This implies that, maybe enough, tall buildings should be stepped back to diminish shadows. Um, how would you define it? Like, what would be... No, I'm saying, uh, well, okay, that, that... Like, what would be the language that you would use to define You it? would, or you would minimize the shadow encroachment. What you're doing here is you're, t you're giving kind of uh, statements about purpose, okay. right? Uh -huh. So maybe you make it another statement of purpose, um, and do it the other way from what I said, say minimize or... or um, I, I wrote define maximum allowable shadow encroachment. In other words, we would, I see, you'd have to define it right here is what you're saying. But I thought it would be just an admission to, to define, maybe I should say it differently, um, minimize shadow encroachment. Mm -hmm. Tall buildings should be stepped back to diminish shadows. Taller buildings should step, um, Taller buildings should step back and overall, uh, you know, you could put it in the same sentence somehow. Mm -hmm. Figured out the words and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just taller buildings, it's overall shadow encroachment. Okay. I think it's probably important. Okay. Uh, um, in other words, you could. In other words, you. On the path. On the path. Okay. On the path, that's right. right. So that's the, the point. Path. That's okay. the point, yeah. In other words, I could imagine where. You'd say, well, you should build. You can build higher on the north side potentially if it's appropriate. Then you can on the south because you're going to not block some on the north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is it? Very building height between three and five stories to minimize shadow encroachment on path. Is that the same part no, of the same? No, no, it's, it's two different it things. Okay. Totally different. I think it's Fine. it's part of total building should be step back um, overall. In shadow encroachment should be monitored or something like that. I'm trying to think of a sentence to stick in there that to, on the path, I 
agree with you. Minimize shadow encroachment on, on the path. On the path, yeah. Minimize shadow encroachment on the path. I think that's it. Okay, I'll go with that. Um, on the first section, down on four, parking and access, parking should be invisible from the sidewalk. I agree. Which one? Um, commercial drivers? Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I agree with that, but is that a good... Parking should be invisible from the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's it's that's a tall order to have it completely invisible, but it's certainly the right direction to go. Um, um, talk about shield. shield. Yeah, I was thinking of that. A little better. It should be screen, but I screen. Don't, I like that. I mean, it, you're endeavoring to be camouflage. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I think it's more like. Um, but are we talking about all parking? I mean, are we talking about parking facilities? I mean, are parking lots or just? Well, it's in it's in the parking and access and commercial corridors. Maximize the of parking and include bike and include bike parking. That's good. Facilitate shared parking to reduce areas of parking lots. That's good. Parking should be invisible from the sidewalk. What we're trying to say is, well, I think it's parking facilities, isn't it? It's parking lots. It's private mm -hmm. parking, not on street parking. Yeah. Private parking, and, and I, I don't want to, it should be as much as possible out, uh, out of view or um, screen, not screen, because then that just makes it too easy. So right. accessory right. parking, in other words, parking that's part of yeah. the use, the mm -hmm. primary use. Right, 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 mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, because if you had a parking garage, it would be impossible to screen it, let's say. Right, it's not going to be invisible. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have to think about it. I, yeah. I the impact impact of, of private parking facilities should be reduced or minimized. Um, mm -hmm. Visible presence of parking minimized. I think minimized is better than invisible. It seems to me what we're trying to get at here is to prevent people from, you know, setting the building back and having the parking out in front. Right. right. Or even minimizing the amount of parking that is, that is visible, like the end of a parking lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. make it a, a three quarters of your site. Make it a much smaller piece of Yeah. So maybe we just need to soften and visible a little bit, but still keep some teeth yeah, in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got to have teeth in it. Just minimize uh, minimize parking uh, visibility from the sidewalk. I mean, mm -hmm. visibility of parking, minimize parking vis visibility from the sidewalk. I don't know if that's a real sentence. Yeah, and it, it's parking should be invisible from the sidewalk. I mean, one of the things that's great about the text that's in the now is that it's it's very kind of. Yeah. Um, you know, short and snappy. Yeah. And, you leave know, leave it, it then. I mean, that's but, that's yeah. a, that's a goal. Yeah. Okay. Strong. Leave it. Um, on the last one, Millbrook Corridor. Do you all want to go two to four stories or two to five stories? Or maybe we talked about this, but I think we did, and I think that um, my memory of our discussion was that um, five stories on the Millbrook Corridor could be could be a lot. I mean, but it's the, same, it's the same as a bike path. It's, it could be a lot, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's that's why I thought, I said, wait a minute, I, I don't want to give five-story allowable allowability either on the bike path or next to Mill Brook, but they're mm -hmm. very comparable. So you're going you're to get some cases where you may. Right, but I guess, you know, the only areas that you're going to be able to get to that height is in you know, your higher uh, business districts. Right. right. So you already have the, con the height control and all the residential parts of the of the bike path. And the, so maybe the three to five isn't quite so bad, you know, because it's going to be concentrated in just the real commercial core district. Where the bike path passes through, let's say, Gold's Gym area. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the zoning is. Is that industrial? industrial. Yeah, it's industrial. Um, it, 
it's no. okay. It's a little, I mean, it's part of the whole issue of how you, you know, it's kind of got to be form-based in a way. It's got to mm -hmm. be based on a, on a plan that looks, that's approvable and so forth. It's okay with me to leave it two to, but two to four, but I see that it's very comparable to to the Minuteman Bikeway. You know, places where you're going to be pretty high around in commercial areas around, around the brook. The Millbrook Corridor, the overall corridor. It's okay if this is a general guideline. I'm not gonna. No, but it's mm -hmm. it's interesting to consider. So we have five on the commercial carters, three to five on Minuteman, and two to four on Millbrook. Is that does that seem right? Is the question. Right. <coughs> trying to think of examples. We I mean we go back and forth the staff because the, mm -hmm. in the visual preference survey, people seemed comfortable with four, and as soon as we went to five, we lost support. Mm -hmm. So we maybe maybe it's two to four and. I like that. As well. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. right. Well, I think for the visual preference, five in certain areas is okay, but not everywhere. Whereas right. four people were more comfortable with the three people were more comfortable with the much larger swaths of town. Right, 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 right. So there are going to be places on the Minuteman, on the uh, Milbrook Corridor where you may be quite high and it's appropriate, like in the right. industrial areas. Yeah, and it's like, you know, the building of 22 mil. Yeah. <coughs> uh, was that three stories or three and a half? I mean, it's... Well, the, the medical office building is... Four. Four. Is, right. is it four? Is well, that all? Well, there might be a basement or something, but it's four. Is it Get in the, the elevator, building? there's four. Yeah, yeah, I think part of it is submerged yeah. in, in, in a below right. grade. Right. And right. It goes up. But, I mean, that doesn't strike me as, as too high. No, no, right. it's fine. I mean, it has kind of that nice kind of... Know, industrial, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. urban feel to it. There. Right, you're going to have more. You have some stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then the other question, then maybe it should be why is three to five on the Minuteman Bikeway? Mm -hmm. Is that because of 22 mil? Or I mean, the other thing is that you've got setbacks mentioned, I believe, on the Minuteman Bikeway. Right. Established buffer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that helps that. So you have a buffer, and you can go three to five, mm -hmm. and then you leave two to four on the Millbrook. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems like you could have those, what's in the Minuteman column could also be a Millbrook and vice versa. Right? Yeah. Because I, I think that sort of is what, what's getting you away from the shadow problem is having the, the upper stories step back. Right. That's one thing that's getting you away from it. Yeah. But I definitely want to add that other sentence so they don't put a four-story building right against the southern wall of the bike path, right. and you're in shadow forever. Mm -hmm. But I'll stick with two to four on the Millbrook corridor. I mean, it's, it's so varied. Some places you're not going to want more than two. Mm -hmm. But other areas, like in the whole industrial area that exists next to my rent, whatever it's called, the industrial zone. They're already high, big, high wooden buildings. Yeah. They're already there. So, depending on the type of development, it might be okay to have that kind of high. Mm -hmm. So it really varies. Uh, leave, leave it as it is. I mean, it's, it's a general guideline, right? Oh, yeah, and I think this is sort of, you know, why we're not quite ready to embrace it and, and merge it into the bylaw. Is that, you know, and, and I think this actually has a better purpose as being a guideline, too. Because yeah. if you try to put it into the bylaw, I think you're going to wind up with, you know, a lot of people attacking it for being vague. Right. Um, so, exactly. But, yeah. Then the last one is just a third. Foster, the last one on the right, middle, foster connections with Mass Ave and the bikeway. You want to say pedestrian connections? Foster pedestrian connections with Mass Ave and the bikeway. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All of them should say that. 
Oh, oh they all do that? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Before we <laughs> the only ones I made were that adding the um, minimum shadow encroachment, yeah. the maximum shadow encroachment, and the um, add the word pedestrian to the faster pedestrian connections with Mass Ave and the Mudflat. If you'd like, we'll, I'll take that. Thank you. I don't have it all. And then the invisible one. Yes. Design standards, town of Arlington, as a <coughs> set of guidelines for development in the commercial quarters, Minuteman Bikeway, and Millbrook Quarter, as amended. Um, and I'm pausing because I don't know if I want to add anything more, but I'm just want to make sure we're adopting it solely as guidelines and not and not as beyond a, that. You know, just say that period. This is adopted. This is to be adopted as guideline, solely as guideline, not as zoning change. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, we'll, and then after it's finalized, we'll distribute it to the VA, the building inspector, and you. So I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Laura. Update us as far as bylaw amendments, okay. please. Um, so first, um, I'll just let you all know that the implementation, the Management Plan Implementation Committee is going to be meeting on October 29th, um, and the staff has started to work on the on the implementation steps that involve going to town meeting because we felt like we needed to get started. Time is passing quickly, um, so. There's a memo in your packet. We've, we've, the staff has been meeting, and we met this uh, last week with Mike Byrne in the building department to talk about what we thought our priorities were, and we asked him what his priorities were. Um, right now, we're working on two, well, three things primarily. One is residential, some changes to deal with um, complaints about new, new houses, uh, all, you know, small houses being demolished and very large houses that max out the lot being built and um, large additions that also are very large for the lots. Um, you know, it's not an easy problem to deal with and it's a problem that many towns are trying to grapple with. Um, these are just some of, some of our thoughts. Uh, one issue we want to try to deal with is the big garage doors that are, are facing the street and so there's just a big curb cut in the front there's not really a front yard anymore um, and um, so the side yards uh, encroachment on neighbors um, and possibly an FAR which is not we have no FAR in the residential zone right now um, but looking at um, it would just control the size of the house in relation to the lot. Um, I think we're open to your thoughts and suggestions on any of these. Definitely the um, implementation committee will be working on this as well, and, and I'm thinking maybe we'll have some kind of working group of people who can um, help us think about this. I know there's a lot of interest in, it, in the community on these issues. your help a little bit as well, Andy, <laughs> if you have any no, thoughts about design. No, I agree with you. But you really have to look at this with a group and iron it out a bit to see mm -hmm. if, if each one is working. Because mm -hmm. these are all kind of trying to get around to the, 
the issue. Maybe they all are affected. I just don't know how they all play out. Right, right. You have to almost draw little diagrams of what you're trying to do. We used to have curb cuts as the thing that limited you. Mm -hmm. But what you're trying to say is not just the curb cut, it's the amount of blacktop that you're allowed to put on. Um, Joey, <laughs> would you like to discuss the how we get around the front yard parking prohibition? Um, you can park on a driveway leading to an accepted parking spot. And um, the tendency is for people to park on that driveway. Um, and they can add two cars in usually in that space. One car is usually um, uh, deeper in mm -hmm. and um, one further out, essentially in the um, front yard setback. But it's not enforced well so that it's become rather accepted. Um, the problem is that we're seeing is, <clears throat> especially in two family houses which are uh, being currently um, erected, that they're, they're having parking underneath the house, so that you have this very wide <coughs> paved area in the very center of the lot, essentially. And what goes the maximum up. width that it can be? 20 feet? 20, um, the driveway, 20 feet, but it, with the curb cut, it becomes 24 feet wide of pavement. Mm -hmm. And if you have a 50 foot wide lot, that's half the lot, mm -hmm. it's curb cut. <coughs> so. But you're seeing a lot of that. I mean, I'm aware of that. Right, because if you're building a house that's as wide as it can be, there's no place to put a driveway to put the parking in the rear. Right. So there's there are different ways to attack that. Like people have a wider side yard. Mm -hmm. um, but well, that gives you a whole lot of pre-existing non-conforming uses with the uh, side yard encroachment. That's right, that's yeah. right. That's right. Um, and I think, you know, this is largely a, a phenomenon with new construction. I, I think that, you know, the older homes that are on some of the smaller lots, you know, which are now pre-existing non-conforming lots, um, you have to do what Joey was just describing. I mean, you may have a, a single car garage and the driveway leading to it, but your lot's just not big enough for that for that second car to go anyplace other than in the driveway that is technically in the front yard. Um, Many of those older garages are not wide enough. Wide, well, no, exactly. The, to be used as garages now, really. Mm -hmm. or, or, or if it. <laughs> Becomes the new storage annex, yeah, which uh, is happening for it. Yeah. Um, but, but now with new construction, you would think like, well, there's a way of finding a home for the, for the vehicles, except for the fact that folks want to max out the, the, the uh, interior living space as much as they can. Mm -hmm. We've also looked at possibly limiting the width of front-facing garage doors a maximum width for, you know, if you have a garage door on the front, a maximum width for, or a maximum total width if you have two garage doors. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, something along those lines is another control. Mm -hmm. Is it just the parking or is it the overall size of the, of the structure on the lot? It's both, yeah. yeah and, and they're kind of related because as, as you make the structure bigger, then you're choices for, for the parking, you know, dwindle. So is that what the FAR is that get this trying to mm -hmm. Yeah. We yeah. almost have to diagram what that does to <laughs> three different size lots just to see. Well, right now we have lot coverage, but still within that lot coverage control, we can actually fit quite a large building mm -hmm. with the two and a half story maximum. 
Yeah, but the, I, I'm intrigued by the FAR thing. I know we're sort of borrowing it from the from from more of the commercial sphere, but um, you know the percentages. I I think you still wind up with a pretty generous house. I mean, if you're in the R zero district and you go 55 percent of FAR, you get 49.50 of interior living space. That's a pretty big house. Um, Ted looked at some of the different residential zones to see what the existing average FAR is, and it was 54 percent, did you say? Well, uh, it depends on when the houses were built. But uh, overall, as a town-wide average, um, the average FAR on a, for a single-family home is uh, 49 percent. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's 54 percent for interwar home interwar homes uh, homes built between 1919 and 1939 and it's about 40 it's about 41% for post world war 2 homes built before 1973 um, and then the the average fars climb you know with more modern homes um, so uh, yeah I, right now um, you know they're uh, older type homes are definitely smaller than what we're seeing built right now in terms of FAR, so that's where we are looking at these FAR controls. Okay, I mean, if you have any thoughts or if you were interested in participating as we go ahead. I have one other thing to add, just, and, and this is on. Uh, point five, when we're talking about signs, removing them from zoning. Um, you may want to just make a note, though, that uh, they should be uh, still part of uh, special form of EDR. <coughs> that, that was um, the building inspector's addition to the list. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, by SP. Um, so, just to talk about the other two things that have been on our list, one is to add mixed use as a new use at, um, with very, uh, with limited setback requirements. The problem, the biggest problem with mixed use right now is that if you have a residential component, the residential has residential setbacks, which are generally like 20 feet. And you don't want that with a mixed-use building with retail on the first floor. So you end up with, well, you, you end up that no one wants to do it because they they don't want to set, step back the residential that much. So um, if we, we, it seemed to us the simplest way to deal with it is to add it as a new use with its own set of requirements. Mm -hmm. One thing that we wanted your input on is whether or not they can be by right, or if they should be by special permit, any mixed-use property. You know, smart growth zoning says if you have a use that you want, you make it by right, and you make it as easy as possible for people to do it. Um, but it does mean that we don't get to put a few cents in, and the design review becomes more complicated, too. You may not get to have that input. So on the second page of the handout, mm -hmm. the MU, this is an existing uh, code, so that's multi-use, not mixed-use? Yes, okay. and that is Sims, the Sims Hospital okay. area, is the only MU zone in town, and the only PUD zone is um, the New York property. New York. Yeah. Um, I was confused by the asterisk um, uh, after mac maximum FAR. It says lower maximum FAR allowed in developments where less than half of gross floor area is non-residential. Is is that read correctly? That's what that's one thought we had. Where basically you're giving a 25 percent FAR bonus for mixed-use properties that are predominantly commercial. And then when you want higher FAR. Right. Well, what we're saying is uh, that the, what I what we're saying there is, if you have a predominantly commercial, mm -hmm. that should read, 
It's meant to read, if you have a predominantly commercial mixed-use property, the max FR would be 150. Okay. But if it's mainly residential, then it would be 125. So instead of allowed, you would have to say required? Required, yeah. Okay. Okay, yes. And these numbers are just experimental. Sure, right. And if you have any thoughts about them, you want to hear about them. So what's the next step? Did you have any thoughts about whether you, the buy right versus special permit? Oh. Well, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. If you want to encourage it, make it easy. Um, but we are kind of, you know, going in a little bit into uncharted waters here, too, so um, I kind of lean more in the special permit direction myself. Yeah. I think it's important to have some oversight. <coughs> it's not that onerous to file a special permit, I suppose. And I, just to sort of build on my, my point, um, you know, and I think the conversation that Ted and I was, was, was just having illustrates it. You could have something that has just a scintilla of commercial use, and now all of a sudden you're trying to get it into, you know, mixed use and evading <coughs> all of the controls that you would have for what we would typically think of would be a residential use. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I'm, you know, until it's, unless you made the mixed use uh, zoning district really complete with all the controls already built in, um, I, I think it's probably more special permit at this stage. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That's helpful. Thank you. It'd be nice to see a little, I mean, you could almost do a little diagram of each one of your uh, lines here. Right? So it's just a quick visual way to understand how big a building would be yeah. with that FAR with zero lot line. Mm -hmm. The only one that you have setbacks in, front yard setback. Well, no, there are two. One is NU, but that's a special. Right. But in B1, you have 20 feet. Why is it 20 feet in B1? That's what's, that's what's existing right there. We didn't change it. In commercial. In, in, in B1, one. right. Because B1 tends to be in the very close to neighborhoods. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. So it's so more like it's transitioning to residents. It's neighborhood office, you know, I see. Yeah. Okay. which are mostly former residences that are. I see. Okay. Okay. I mean, you do the same thing with your, your houses that have that lot covers, just to see. Because I, I think a lot of it is just these monstrous things that are just tightly packed and then they have to figure out how to get the driveway <laughs> you know, to work. So a little FAR diagram would be useful. Mm -hmm. You guys can do it. It could be very helpful. Because you'd instantaneously understand what you're talking about mm -hmm. in terms of sure. coverage, setbacks, and height. Right. We'll try to do that. <laughs> so we can look at it. Hopefully it'll be <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, and the other one was parking. Um, so this is related to mixed use because we, I think we want to talk about requiring less parking in commercial zones in general, um, but also multifamily residential. Um, there is evidence, like certainly some of the older buildings in town um, have one parking space per unit. And um, the Pam Hallett of the Housing Corporation of Arlington says that she does not um, use all the parking in many of the facilities they own. And she's looking for reduced parking in their next project. Um, so I'm actually looking at doing what's called a right size parking study, which is kind of a market study for what what do residential developments have for parking, and how is the demand? Um, but 
what we were, what I was considering, what staff has discussed is to allow a reduction in parking. Right now, the bylaw allows a um, reduction to 80% of the requirement, but to allow it to go lower by special permit with um, some kind of transportation demand management, meaning that the owner has to um, do some things to encourage people not to have two cars. You know, I, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say no cars, but I would say one car could be adequate for some households. So uh, that would mean maybe um, providing T passes, bike facilities, indoor bike facilities. Um, an office might have a shower. Um, I'm trying to think of what the other ones are. What, th there's a number of different things that they can do to encourage people not to drive. Carpool, give preferential treatment to people who carpool, have zip cars, bikes, that, a bike rental, like cowboy type thing. But again, that would be by special permit, so they'd have to come here. Like, remember when the Hilton Hotel came in and they needed to provide all this parking, even though they kept saying they don't need it. And they, they, they wouldn't build a hotel without parking, because parking is that important to their business model, but they didn't need more parking. And yet we had to require a certain number of parking spaces. There was no way to get around that. So this would give a little more flexibility. Especially, you know, for a business or a residence that's close to Alway, mm -hmm. you know. So that was the, that's our, an approach that occurred to us. You know, there's other ways of doing it. You could have a range. You could say you could, a residence could have one to, one to two per unit, you know, and then it ha they can do one or two. But this just, I thought, sort of covered everything all at once. Good. I'm yeah, interested to see what, what other towns are doing in mm -hmm. Cambridge. How are they, how's it working out for them? They've already got this in place. They have parking maximums in Cambridge. They don't want you to provide too right. much parking. Yeah. So it's always so, good to know. I mean, it's, it's a, obviously Boston is a, a totally different type of right. urban environment, right. but right. some of the new uh, projects have a, uh, there's a no parking requirement. You know, mm -hmm. Like the North Station, because it's a transportation hub. Mm -hmm. right. so, I don't think we're ready for that. No, no. <laughs> but more the ones that are comparable to us. Yeah, but we, I mean, our, we have transit here. We have decent transit here, but we don't have great transit here. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. We don't have a train, so, except at LA. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, okay. just wanted to run the ideas by. <coughs> okay. All right, so approval of minutes from our last meeting. And a couple of comments. Um, and uh, I think there's just something that's left out in the uh, second full paragraph, the very last sentence. This is talking about the um, parks at the hotel site. And the sentence reads, neighbors expressed interest in having the town parks behind the sidewalk between Route 16 and the hotel is willing to do that. They so wanted the hotel to be in the front of the park. Okay. Can you tell me how many lines down? I'm, I'm on. The last the paragraph of. Or the last sentence of the. Sorry, second last paragraph. sentence of the second paragraph. Okay. Uh, neighbors expressed interest in having the town park parks. The neighbors wanted the hotel to maintain. And having the hotel maintain the town parks. The town parks okay. adjacent to the hotel site. Instead of that, um, the following sentence, um, just a clarification. So, uh, the beginning after the comma of a phrase that says, so that the, and I think the word hotels restaurant would not become a public restaurant. Um, what paragraph is that? That's the following paragraph, the one that begins Ms. O'Connor added that the owner of Claremont would be okay agreeing to a deed restriction. Right, so that the restaurant would not become. 
so that the hotel's restaurant would not become a public restaurant. Over on the next page, the third paragraph at the end of the first line uh, with the tandem spaces is, should be there instead of in. Um, and then on the following page, this is special condition five on a permit that reads, there shall be no public use of the hotel. And I think we want the word amenities. We want there to be public use of the hotel. We just don't want the amenities, such as the boardroom or restaurant, yeah. being used by anyone other than hotel guests and staff. See what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's all. <clears throat> I have one thing, it's just second page, one, two, three, four, five paragraphs down, it says Mr. West cited benefits of the proposal mm -hmm. and added that, the, added that the hotel, instead of the word will, say has incentive to. I don't know that they will, I, did, I just said they have incentive to. Mm -hmm. manage the parking as best as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And then all I found <clears throat> was there are a few references to John Warden. His name is misspelled. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, should I just look for them? There is the, back? the last line on the third Warden, page. Yeah, yep. Warden. And then two references to him about halfway down the final page. in my brief tenure okay. as chair, but uh, I'm very sad that this is probably Bruce Fitzsimmons' last meeting this evening, so I want to thank you for your years of service, your help in getting me acclimated to the board and sitting next to me in <clears throat> my time as chair, walking through special permit hearings and public hearings. Uh, you will be missed. I will miss you. I will keep you on speed dial <laughs> <laughs> the next year or so, but uh, thank you, Bruce, for all that you've done. Well, you're, you're very welcome, and it's been a pleasure to be on the board. Um, you know, it's, uh, this is really, you know, a group of colleagues, and it's collegial, you know, in that regard, too. So there's a high respect for what everybody does here, what everyone brings to the table. And uh, that also goes for a wonderful planning staff, too. And we're very uh, fortunate to have such a great group of professionals helping us look good in public. So, um, that is true. Yeah. Um, and if anyone is ever considering being a appointee on a town board, I highly encourage them to do so. It's been a great experience. I've learned a lot from it, and um, you know, I've enjoyed all the time that I've been here. And I want to second what Andrew said um, about Bruce. Um, I don't know how many years it's been, but it's been a, a long service. And uh, you were really the leader. You have been the, lead, the, the head of the board. Uh, I think you had at least one term or extended terms and led um, important projects for the town, such as 22 Mill, or the project around 22 Mill Street. And um, I think that even when you weren't the, the actual head of the board, you were a, a great leader for us. I think we needed to grown up to come into the into, onto the board, <laughs> at least for me. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that in all the, jokingly in a way, but in the best sense of uh, <clears throat> uh, a great leader and also a great friend, uh, it's made it really enjoyable to have you on the board. And uh, you should be very proud of the service that you've had and the friendships that you've made. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a pleasure working with you as well. I, 
appreciate it. Your interest in affordable housing in particular. But in every way. Thanks. We have not adjourned. We have not adjourned. Oh, right, we approve the minutes. <laughs> Move to adjourn. We are sorry. continuing. Oh, we're oh, continuing. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's see. That's get the <laughs> parliamentary part of this right. <laughs> so we're recessing. I think we're, yeah, we're recessing. Okay. Yeah. I guess we're we need Bruce one last time. Yeah. Yeah. The motion. <laughs> so I move that we recess the meeting to reconvene at Trist in 10 minutes, something like that, or where no business shall be discussed. I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.